I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Professor George de Troyes from St Thomas's Hospital, London. And we're actually recording tonight from his office. So, <laughs> welcome, George. Thank you very much. As I'm sure you can imagine, uh, we have many, many calls to our helpline, many emails, many uh, requests for information on our Twitter and Facebook regarding paediatric allergy. So it's great to have the opportunity tonight to ask you directly some of those questions. I'm sure we won't be able to get through all the questions that we've been asked this evening, so I've selected a, a, a few for you. Those of you who've submitted questions, we don't cover those topics. We will make sure that we look at your questions and we will respond to you over the next few days. So if I start with probably the most common question that we're asked, George, which is, what are the major risk factors for developing food allergy? Very often this question comes from uh, parents who already have a child who has food allergy and they're thinking about future children they may have or other children in the family who haven't displayed um, the symptoms of, of food allergy. So perhaps you can describe to us what the major risk factors are. Thank you, Lynn, and, and thank you to um, all of you who are taking the time to attend or, or to view this later on. So I, I think up front it's important to realise that most children don't become food allergic. So the population prevalence is around 6 to 8 percent, depending on the study, the country you're looking at, and the food allergen. Uh, the best, uh, probably the worst predictors or uh, to, to have, and, and, and the best at predicting those likely to go on to food allergy is probably early onset eczema. We now know that most food allergy, um, is, the sensitization, the first step towards becoming allergic probably occurs through your skin. So the young infant with early onset troublesome eczema is at great risk for going on, on to develop food allergy as they get older. But of course you need some genetic pedigree for this. So if there's already an allergic sibling in the family, this increases your chance fairly significantly. If one or both your parents, particularly your mum, always blame your mum if your mum's allergic, the risk is, is slightly higher. So the, the um, at-risk genetic family and then the baby that's born that then has troublesome eczema, sometimes other non-specific gut symptoms um, can put you at greater risk of, of developing food allergy. And of course, if, even if you look at twins, it's not absolute that even identical twins will develop the same food allergy. So it's slightly variable, and there, of course, are many environmental factors that can lead to this. So we think that the, the worst scenario is for uncontrolled, untreated eczema in an environment where one or other allergen is, is particularly commonplace. And, and so the, the skin is tickled, the immune system is tickled with light doses of this allergen whilst the child is not yet eating it. And there's certainly many animal models will support that as the root of sensitization and allergy um, over time. So these are the factors we discuss in clinic um, with, with families every day. Thank you, George. Um, is there anything that parents can do to help prevent their child, if the child has severe eczema, as you describe, from them developing food allergy, are there steps that they can take? So I think basic, basic health strategies will certainly do no harm. So a very healthy diet during mom's pregnancy, plan to have a, a natural childbirth if that's possible, but of course in, in 20, 30% of, of deliveries that's not possible. There's some studies showing a weak effect and certainly no harm from, from mom taking a probiotic. There's some studies showing a reduction in asthma if mom takes um, omega-3, but these are uh, very high doses required for this. So this is not yet a public health strategy. But certainly a, a healthy pregnancy, of course, is advised. Once the baby is born, uh, there are some pilot studies that look at the frequent application of a moisturizer to the skin to prevent eczema, and we know that eczema is a risk factor for food allergy. So certainly if, if your baby has a dry, crusty, oozy rash, a very dry skin, you want to treat this quite aggressively, even while they're young. You want to seek care, take some medical advice, and get the right creams onto the skin. 
And there are many studies underway now looking to see if this can prevent the onset of food allergy later on. When the baby comes to a weaning age, you want to consider um, recent studies, including LEAP and EAT and, and many other studies uh, that, that study egg introduction, that hint uh, well, uh, towards peanut, there's a strong effect of early introduction, but for some of the other allergens, there's a hint that the earlier introduction of these into the diet may be beneficial. So what I encourage parents to do is the strategies I've just told you, but then uh, just to guide the infant whilst breastfed um, to at least be on four months of age and preferably continue longer if you can. And when mom feels her baby is hungry and ready to wean, the baby has good head control, is swallowing foods well, is following food around, uh, is seeking to eat the food and is, is able to swallow with comfort, and then I would start weaning onto basic weaning foods. And if the child is at risk, I would have them allergy tested first as per guidelines. And then if, if testing is negative, I would introduce common food allergens. If the child has no risk factors, sales through early infancy with a normal skin, no eczema, no other worrying symptoms, I would again just encourage weaning when mom feels the baby is ready. This may be before this target of six months, which we've long um, been chasing as a public health strategy. In fact, most infants around, depending on the country, you look at 96, 97% of infants will not breastfeed exclusively till six months of age. Most will continue breastfeeding, but additional foods will be added to that diet. So there's no need to be scared of introducing food slightly earlier when the baby um, um, is ready. And hopefully these strategies together will help reduce the risk of food allergy. That's very helpful, George. And it is very complicated for, for parents. Um, and there's so much different advice out there. Um, we've obviously got advice on our, our website and um, hopefully people will access our help. But also I think if people are worrying, they should go along to their medical practitioner and discuss their worries with them. But that's really, really helpful. The, another thing that we're, people often ask us about, as you know, people come along to clinic or they go to their GP, they're, they're quite worried about what the situation they're going to face. And they don't always understand in that context the things that they're being told by the practitioner at that time and one question that we're asked very often is about tests and what types of tests are used to diagnose allergy and what food allergy and what do those tests actually mean so we we certainly wouldn't advocate testing for a healthy baby. If your baby's doing well, eating foods, no gut symptoms, no skin symptoms, no previous um, um, food symptoms, there's no need uh, to undergo testing. If the child's at risk or there's some early symptoms noted, or indeed if you're crippled with fear, this anxiety that you spoke about, Lynn, and, and moms are scared to wean, then perhaps you'd want to just screen for the, the common food allergens. The way you could do, with, do this is through skin prick testing, which many of you know would be applying a, a drop of the allergen onto the arm, touching through light, lightly with a lancet, and if you're likely allergic, you will develop a big hive within some 15, 20 minutes. And if you're not allergic um, on that day of the testing, you will have no response. This is a very old test. It appears very simple, but it's, it's accurate at extremes, as are all allergy tests. In other words, if your test is negative to peanut on the day of testing, the chance that we are wrong is one in a hundred, as long as the technique is, is, is done properly. So it's extremely reassuring when negative. If the test is highly positive, depending on some variables, eczema, other food allergies, and the size of the test, we can also predict with a fair amount of certainty that this is valid and that you are indeed allergic. And that's true for IgE testing, the blood testing, where a blood sample is taken and sent to the lab, and then the blood is, is added, and through a chemical reaction, we can measure the amount of, of antibodies, uh, the IgE antibody that are binding to these allergens. Again, if that is negative, it has a very high negative predictive value. In other words, if you eat that food, you're extremely unlikely to react on that day, soon thereafter. If the test is very high on blood testing, like with a skin prick test, then of course you may well um, react, and it becomes more predictive the higher it gets. And again, there's a gray zone, a range in between where the art of allergy comes in. So here we would look 
or pre-test risk factors, the family history, the eczema. If we're looking at an allergen like peanut, we know if you're egg allergic, that cranks up your chances. So the, the chance of being peanut allergic in, in the UK and many developed countries, if you are egg allergic, is around 30%. That's it's one in three children, extremely high. So we need to add all these factors, which is not unique to allergy. People, we do this in everyday pediatric practice. If we take a full blood count and you're anemic and ill and it's slightly low, we know that's relevant. If a child is charging around and the blood count is slightly low, we know that's probably not relevant. So you put these factors together to interpret um, testing. The gold standard test is, of course, if you can eat the food in an age-appropriate portion. So if I offer you a handful of peanuts and you eat this happily with absolutely no symptoms, you are peanut tolerant, regardless of your test, whether it's big or small or whatever that test is. And again, if I give you one peanut and you develop an allergic reaction, regardless of your test result, we take that very, very seriously. And that is, is the gold standard. So the three tests, the skin pick test, the IgE test, and then the oral food challenge test. But of course, don't undervalue a clinical history where your clinician sits down with you and asks you these questions. Does your child eat a whole hard-boiled egg when they're four years of age? Do they like scrambled egg? Do they like omelet? And if they really grill you, they can usually get to a fairly accurate answer with regards to tolerance or allergy. Thank you. I mean, yes, that's very true, George. What uh, we do emphasize to people who contact us is to make sure when they're discussing the situation with their clinicians, they're prepared to give a full history to the clinician, which will help you determine what tests are needed, where the tests are needed. And we know that the food ch oral food challenge is the gold standard, as it were, but that can be quite a challenge for parents and their children. It can children be very stressful and a challenge for staff, and particularly for the, the yes. patient if, if they're going to react. But it's highly informative. And, and even when they're positive, in other words, when, when the patient has a reaction, people are extremely appreciative as long as it's controlled, done in a safe setting, with consent, mm. and, and people are aware of, of what they're undergoing. Another area which we're often asked about is particularly where children have multiple food allergens, which is quite difficult for allergies, mm. which is very difficult for families to manage, as I'm sure you could do you know, what's the chance that children will outgrow food allergies? And I know this differs, the rate differs for different mm. foods, so perhaps you could describe that for us. Correct, Lynn. So if, if you're going to become food allergic, if you're given the option, you would, as a young child, you would choose egg or milk. They have an extremely good prognosis over time, so the vast majority of children will outgrow this. It may take some, some years before they fully outgrow it, and of course there's a small percentage, some 10 to 15 percent, who won't outgrow egg or milk allergy. Remember, these are structural allergens that have a shape. So the healthier the food, the more intact the proteins, the more allergenic, the more likely uh, you will react to this food. But many of these um, young children, as they get older, start eating processed forms of these foods where the allergenic shape has been damaged by heat so the more unhealthy the food, the less allergenic, like biscuit, cake, or muffin. And that's the, the typical history with egg and milk allergy is, is children will hate all egg and milk con containing foods when they're younger if they're allergic to them. As they get older, they'll start developing tolerance to highly processed forms of this food. As they get older yet and more tolerant, they will start tolerating cheese and yogurt and fromage frais if milk allergic. And with egg, eventually they'll go on and eat scrambled egg and omelet and quiche and healthier forms of the egg protein. Wheat, in my experience, generally has a good prognosis as well, that many wheat allergic children over time will develop tolerance to wheat and related cereal grains such as um, rye and barley. And early on in their lives, we get them onto oat and quinoa and buckwheat, which are generally safe for most wheat, wheat allergic patients. Now, the opposite is true for um, foods that have these seed storage proteins like nuts and sesame. These are troublesome allergies. Uh, if you're allergic to one, you're often allergic to one or more of, of the others. They, they are persistent allergies that can cause nasty reactions, and they, they seldom be outgrown. So only about 10 to 15 percent of children will outgrow um, allergies to nuts, which is the exact opposite for egg and milk. Of course, there are many other allergies that you can be allergic to, and some are quite new, and we're still studying and learning about. 
things like um, legumes, pea, chickpea, lentil, in my experience, will, will persist. Kiwi fruit will persist. Soy is sometimes outgrown, sometimes not. So each allergen behaves in a different way, uh, which is very strange, but I guess makes sense given that they derive from entirely different sources. Some are animal proteins and some are plant-based proteins. Um, and so they each have their own unique pattern. And of course, for each child, it is different. Mm. Probably the best prognosticator is the child that is mono food allergic to egg and milk. So they present, and this is quite rare these days, is only allergic to milk or egg as a young infant, has no other allergies. They stand a better chance of outgrowing this over time. The child with poly food allergy obviously has a longer, more protracted course. And uh, again, in our experience of the calls that we received to the helpline, um, I know that peanut is very, very high profile, very high profile uh, food allergy to have. But the one that really, really is so tricky to avoid is milk. Mm. Correct. Um, so uh, peanut gets a lot of air time and uh, mm. a, a lot of research, and and I guess peanut isn't outgrown. So Although it affects some 2 3%, depending on, on which country you're living in, of children, it will generally persist. So as a population, it's around, it's a common food allergen, and it can cause nasty reactions. People are aware of it. Milk equally can cause nasty reactions. It's, it's equally common um, as, as a food allergen, but generally outgrown. So if you look at a population, milk is, is less represented because most adults will outgrow it. But for milk, the, the child who doesn't outgrow their milk allergy, who goes into their teen years of milk allergy, they have a terribly tough time. Yes. This is a ubiquitous protein. It can be aerosolized. So milk in the air can make them cough and wheeze if they go into a small coffee shop and, and, and milk has been frothed. This can set them off. It's extremely hard um, for them to avoid. They often re remain allergic even to baked milk, which can be in many different products. Milk labeling is a challenge. That milk can be called, called many different names. And so unless you're well trained by a dietitian or people experienced in this, it's extremely hard to avoid, avoid milk. And indeed, I find some of the toughest allergens, at least for a teenager, um, allergies to have are allergies to egg and milk for those reasons. Mm. The next area I'd like to talk about is probably quite a contentious area, but we'll, we will talk about it because we have so many contacts uh, to our helpline, to the anaphylaxis campaign about it, and that's the subject of adrenaline injectors. And um, just a few questions on those, uh, really, which were uh, the most common questions we get asked. Um, I think it can be a very frightening experience when people are prescribed an adrenaline injector. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about the process for deciding who gets an adrenaline injector and how you, you work that issue through? So, so adrenaline is an emergency medicine. It, it's a natural medicine. Uh, everyone ha hopefully has two adrenal glands. It's a Crete adrenaline. So what, what you're injecting is, is basically a natural petrol. It's a, it's a medicine that drives your heart faster, stronger contractions, lifts up your blood pressure, and opens your airways. It works for a, a short period of time. You can only use adrenaline if, if you have it on you and you know how to use it properly. And those are both challenges for, for various reasons. It's very hard to, to teach people when to, when to administer it, how to administer it, and to encourage, um, particularly children as they get older, to always always carry the devices on their person. However, if, if somebody is at risk of a severe reaction, it's a very easy answer to give you. They, they need to carry adrenaline, and if they need to carry one device, I believe they need to carry two. One device, even if administered properly, may be insufficient, and people have sadly still demised even after adrenaline has been uh, correctly administered. So occasionally, very occasionally, two devices need to be administered. And I, in our trials, I've had needed to administer adrenaline many, many times. And generally, um, one uh, adrenaline device is usually sufficient for most reactions. Most reactions are mild to moderate, so it's important to stress that. So who is at risk of these rare, potentially life-threatening, severe reactions? So we know that those with uncontrolled asthma are certainly at risk. 
those who have previously had very nasty reactions may be at risk of a future nasty reaction. It's sometimes difficult to predict those who've had mild to moderate reactions may have a severe reaction the next time, but they have an equal chance of having a milder or equivalent um, reaction the next time. We know that certain allergens can cause severe reactions, uh, certainly nuts, and if you're older, egg, egg and milk, uh, shellfish, and indeed, any food allergen, if you're unlucky, can cause a severe reaction. So I've had patients have very nasty reactions to the seed of a watermelon or a pomegranate um, um, seed, which are now very popular to eat in the UK. And, and so it's very hard to know to be driven by the allergen. So we look at risk factors. Of course, there are many other risk factors. Uh, do you live close to medical support if something was, was going wrong? Can you converse in the language where you are? Can you read labels? Are you in a strange country? So many variables go into our, our general decision. But in, in my daily practice, if I believe somebody has a significant food allergy that could cause a nasty reaction, putting those factors together, uh, I, I would issue an adrenaline device. Far more important than that, however, is education around the allergen, how to avoid it, how it's labeled, how to recognize the symptoms of a reaction. And I believe far too much emphasis in our daily practice is put onto this device that only lasts for a few minutes, it soon wears off, that may or may not help you, generally does, um, but in, in, in some patients it hasn't. Most of our efforts should be going into how to avoid um, the, the allergen as best possible. So I've described some patients who definitely need adrenaline, of course, they're patients who don't. The young infant uh, who has already reacted to egg and hasn't had a nasty reaction, has, uh, you know, lives close to medical support and people understand their family have great insight into avoiding this allergen, I would certainly not, not give them an, an adrenaline device. There's a gray zone in between that and a lot of anxiety comes up around that. If your child is only allergic to pee and they're four years of age um, and you have some insight into this, but you know that pee is in a lot of children's foods, do they need an adrenaline device? And, and you'll get a different answer from the clinician. You answer and you won't, you ask and there won't be guidelines that, that cover every single scenario. And hence the frustration that, that comes about for families. I hope that answers your yeah. question somewhat. I know it's a very um, sort of controversial area, if you like. And um, I think from the perspective of the anaphylaxis campaign, the, the key message for us is if you are prescribed adrenaline by your mm -hmm. clinician, make sure you always carry that adrenaline. That's the first point. Also, as well as making sure you are always carrying it, practice, practice, practice. And we do say to people to use an expired pen to actually Correct. practice on an orange and choose a date in the year. Correct. Not not the child's birthday, <laughs> but a, a date, the, uh, a familiar date, and just keep practicing mm. for parents to keep practicing and for the children to keep practicing. Correct. That's that's just so important, isn't so it? The, the, the analogies I use is if, if your young child runs into traffic, you will grab them out without reading any labels or reasoning. It'll be a, a knee-jerk reaction. And the same if you notice significant severe symptoms, you need to know how to use the device without reading the instructions and you must be confident in it. And that only comes about through, through practice. I've got some older patients who are either crippled by fear or rather inquisitive and for them, I've allowed them to inject themselves with the real adrenaline device. And that removes a lot of fear because it's not as painful um, and it certainly doesn't feel as strange as many of them have anticipated. Not, not the bulk of my patients don't take up that offer, but I think it's a very good strategy. And short of that, then practicing with an expired device. And what's very helpful is to practice against some leather with a glass window behind you, so you can appreciate how the adrenaline is is ejected through a device, how quickly it is ejected, and how important it is that you hold the needle on, on onto the tissue for as long as that device mandates. Um, we know that children of frequently anxious when they're first injected with a device and they often move. So it's, it's extremely important to hold the device on with confidence, to be in the right anatomical region so you inject into muscle and not fat and bone and other tissues, otherwise you won't get an adequate response. But if you hold that leg firmly and the, uh, 
to prevent the child from kicking, you'll stop secondary injuries, which are frequently common. I see this in clinic. The child jerks after injected, mm. and the long needle tears their skin, and you land up not only having had adrenaline, but with a laceration as well. Mm. And I think the other me message that we should emphasize, and sometimes clinicians don't emphasize this, is adrenaline is not a harmful drug. It right. will not hurt the person to whom it is administered. I think right. that's yeah. a really important Yes, message. I always stress that point with the adrenal glands. It's a natural circulating hormone. We all have it in our bodies. Um, but it's terribly frightening having to inject your, your sick child. And I, on our trials, when I've, mm. and I know families intimately, and I've certainly trained them many times how to administer these devices, if we anticipate a severe reaction, I often allow the parents to, to uh, administer the device. And it's quite sad to see how difficult it is to do as a parent. It's extremely emotional. And my last dad, as an example, was, was shaking so much. It, it's so frightening for them. And I remember I was holding his hand to keep his hand still, and I could feel his tears falling on my hand. <laughs> it's an extremely emotional process. So, so practice being confident with it. Thank you. That, those are very important messages. The other message about adrenaline, which is it always interesting, but nonetheless true. We know that about a third of the adrenaline pens that are out there are out of date. So checking the expiry date is so very, very important, isn't it? So, um, as I say, there's been lots and lots of issues um, around adrenaline that come come through to our helpline. Is there any other message you would like to give around that area? Well, the main message is, is to concern yourself more with allergen avoidance. Yeah. Um, with regards to adrenaline administration, the, the one very tricky thing is to know when to give it. Obviously, even severe allergic reactions will often start with a mild phenomena. Most reactions are mild to moderate. So when your child develops a few hives and a swollen lip, it's very hard for anyone to predict if this is going to go on and to, to become more severe. And so they, the way I teach this to parents and every clinician will, will, will have different clinical indications is I tell them if the symptoms on the outside of your body, so if the child has hives and swelling, perhaps one or two vomits, uh, you'll mostly get away quite happily just with some antihistamine. For symptoms on the inside of your body, so any airway chains, so cough or wheeze or rapid breathing, or a drop in blood pressure, which of course is, is very difficult to measure, but the child that goes floppy, gray, limp, that is, is instantly unrousable, and I see this a lot in trials actually, I think it's under-recognized. The child who eats an allergen has some gripes or complaints about what they've just eaten and then instantly goes to sleep or dozes off or says, says they feel sleepy. That is not a good sign, mm -hmm. and, and that's a sign that I consider as being on the inside of the body, and I'd, I'd rather you administer adrenaline early in that scenario. You will do absolutely no harm to a young, healthy child administering adrenaline. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, certainly they don't enjoy it, and they, they, everyone is slightly traumatized for a while afterwards, but it's often um, life-saving. One of the very positive developments is the fact that from the 1st of October we'll have generic adrenaline injectors in schools. Um, so if a child, for whatever reason, doesn't have their adrenaline injector available, those pens will be available. Also, a great byproduct of that is that as well as having uh, being able to have generic pens in schools, it will mean that schools will have to be trained to administer the adrenaline. And again, I think we would say it's not only the school nurse, it's not even a designated teacher that needs to know how to administer the adrenaline, but all school staff. Correct. Yeah, it basically comes down to training and knowledge and, and, and just appreciation and respect for, for somebody having a food allergy under your care. Is, are there any other issues that commonly come to you, George, when patients are coming to your clinic? Um, I think patients are extremely lucky in the South East. We have excellent paediatric allergy services. They're not always so great across the rest of the country. So uh, we get a lot of calls from parents who maybe don't have access to such specialist care. Are there any key messages you think that we, that we should get across to people? 
Um, basically, keep knocking on your, on, in the UK, uh, certainly knocking on your healthcare provider's door. If, if you believe your child has an aversion to one food, you've noticed some symptoms, it's worth um, um, sorting this out and, and ensuring that at least they get diagnosed and have a thorough allergy assessment. Where you find one food allergy, you frequently will find another. And uh, I, I believe it harsh um, when folks say, well, you need to react to food, to a food before we'll give you an intervention and an emergency plan. So, for example, a child who just reacts to egg that, that's at very low risk as an infant, I will always check to see if they have a, a cashew or a peanut allergy or one of the other more common allergies because you prevent people going on and having an allergic reaction. To allow folks just to knock their head along the way is, is, is a pretty brutal approach. And, and so sometimes if, if you don't have easy access to care, you, you do have to shout a little louder. <laughs> and the other area which we get loads of calls about is the troublesome teenager. When children are little and they're under the control of their parents, things feel a lot safer in terms of avoidance, in terms of um, making sure they carry their adrenaline. But we know, particularly for young boys, carrying adrenaline pens is not something they're very keen to do. Young girls have handbags. Yes. Many yes. Boys don't have handbags. Yes. And once children get to the age of 14, 15, 16, they start to exert their independence, be more away from home. What, how do you cope with children in your clinic who are reaching that sort of age? So I agree with you. This is extremely stressful time for parents because they, they're losing control and it's a stressful time for, for parents of, of non-allergic children. But they're often worried that the child will willingly eat the allergen or will behave badly. And, and the truth is I just don't see that. Even uh, you know, teenagers who, who've had a, a beer or two, if they know they're peanut allergic, they're extremely respectful um, of that concept. The risk comes about through other people preparing their cuisines as opposed, uh, opposed um, to their mother doing it. And so I have great respect for teenagers. I think that they, 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 they get a lot of flack for, for this. They by and large do try extremely hard, in my experience, to avoid their known allergens. They, it, it's strange. I even see this in younger children who couldn't possibly remember reacting to a food. They really do try and avoid the allergens. And it, it's just surprising that, because you can tell them a, a hundred different instructions that, that avoid, avoid uh, and, and ignore 99. But the food allergen avoidance they generally take seriously. But there are other risk factors that come with, with being a teenager. So eating out, being out and about, perhaps you know, having a party and, and behaving slightly differently. And, and of course, we know that teenagers are a particular risk for more severe reactions. And I don't think this comes about only due to behavior and exposure. I think there's something different in the body that we know this changes even at around four to five years of age, that the very young infant is at very low risk of life-threatening and severe reaction. But as you push past four or five years and then incrementally into your second decade of life, uh, the risk goes up substantially. And uh, so there's good reason to be cautious about this. As far as carrying the emergency plan, it can be difficult and it's, it's individual dependent. Some teenagers, e even boys, teenage boys are extremely good at doing this, some not so much. And the device is, is clumsy for a boy to carry in, in their trousers. Uh, most of the devices that are alternatives in America and, and we need to develop more alternatives yet. The most obvious solution hopefully somebody out there could develop is, is to link the device to a mobile phone. Mm, a teenager true. will never leave their mobile mm. phone at home. You can always locate them. You can instruct them. Uh, you speak to them through this. It's, it's the most obvious marriage is the phone and an emergency device linked together. But strangely, no, no one has got to this yet. Mm. I think the other message that we would give to parents to, when they're talking to their teenagers and they're beginning to be more independent is to make sure that they tell their friends um, and are able to talk easily about the fact that they have this severe allergy. And that can make, that can make a huge difference, I think, Correct. when they get uh, support to their teenagers. Talking about travel, travel is a very um, scary time. And t a teenagers yeah. often want to go to lovely holiday destinations. The problem with many coastal resorts, be this in Asia, Southern Africa, Southern America, is cashew and, and peanut and many other common food allergens are in those traditional cuisines. And so parents worry incredibly when, when, when teenagers go traveling and, and a responsible friend goes a long way to allay some of those fears. I mean, we have examples of very severely allergic young people who are allergic to multiple allergies 
who have actually gone to places like Thailand and Singapore. Um, their parents have been, ex particularly their mums, I think, have been yeah. extremely worried that they'd come back and written blogs for us and described how they've managed their allergies while they've been away. So I think, you know, it's very, it's obviously very hard for parents, but in encouraging the, the parents to let the child mm -hmm. bear the risk as soon as they're able, and that will that will depend from one child mm -hmm. to another, of course. Yeah, it, it comes down to risk management, and there are some extremely helpful recent publications putting putting risk into perspective. That probably your child flying to Thailand is is a far greater risk than I'm going to Thailand with with a nut allergy. The flat risk alone is higher, but still that risk is real for you. That mm -hmm. if it's your family affected or you yourself, the, the risk is 100%. And people live in fear of that. And these are preventable events as opposed to an, an act of God, as it were. And so parents worry about this e enormously. Uh, it's important again for me to stress that most reactions are mild to moderate. They're not very comfortable, they're not very nice, they're frightening, particularly for the, the participant or the, the patient and the family, but generally they will settle. Severe life-threatening reactions can largely be treated with adrenaline if, if you're well skilled and trained and you're carrying the device. Thank you very much, George. I think that covers the, the key areas that um, I wanted to discuss with you this evening. George is a member of our clinical panel, which is great. And, and as everyone will know, the information that we give is always clinically based and discussed with our, with our panel members. Thank you so much for doing this Thank webinar. You. Thanks for the opportunity this, and thanks evening. for listening for any poor customers out there. <laughs> <laughs> those, those people whose questions we haven't covered, and I know that there, there are some, um, what we'll do is we'll look through those questions and we'll respond to people in the next few days. Also, if there are other areas that we haven't covered and you think, oh, I wish I'd asked that or I wish they'd covered that, do contact our helpline um, or tweet us or ask through our Facebook and um, we'll do our best to come back to you with the answers. But for this evening, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.